All right. Welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. Today, we are lucky to be joined by Sujin Patel. Sujin is a growth marketing expert. He owns and runs about five plus software companies, invests in countless others. He races supercars, motorcycles in his spare time. And of course, he is a dad. How's it going today, Sujin? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pumped to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. We, I, I discovered you actually through Mailshake years ago. I didn't realize that you were behind it. And then uh, Nev Medora, who we're both big fans of, I was watching nice. his podcast and I was like, put two and two together. And <laughs> Nev said, oh, by the way, this guy's also got, uh, got kids. You should talk to him. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've been, wa- I've been binge, uh, listening, watching your, uh, your show. It's awesome. I love it. Um, uh, I've been looking for, you know, uh, a dad groups that are uh, folks that are ambitious and, and, and great fathers. So, um, I'm excited to be on here. I appreciate it. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's a lot easier for me to relate to entrepreneurs and people that have kids. Uh, while I love, Tim Ferriss, and he inspired me in a lot of things to hear about waking up at eight and having my tea and meditating when I've got a a kid jumping in my bed and yelling at me to play Barbies. I'm like, there's a little disconnect there. So it's good to talk to other dads. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, sleeping in is, uh, I don't know, I haven't done that in a long time. So I don't know how it feels. And, And relaxation is different. You have to find ways to be relaxed or at peace with in chaos. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, at least I have young, very young kids. So chaos is, is every day, but, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's chaos no matter what, what age they are. Right. Absolutely. Everybody tells me, wait till they get this. I'm like one day at a time. We got mine are eight, six and three. How old are your kids now? Uh, two, uh, and some change. And then I have twin eight month olds. Wow. So you, you are that, right yeah. up in it. Yeah, my wife and our, you know, we're in the struggle, which is which is fun and you know, uh, difficult at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was was twins a surprise, or how did that uh, how did that turn out? Uh, we were we were trying for you know another uh, child, and then all of a sudden, you know, this the having twins was a surprise, and it turns out, you know, they twins are in my wife's extended family. They, as soon as we found out we're having twins, we're like, oh yeah, there's like four other people in her family that have <laughs> twins. Like, oh yeah, t- probably it's something that's genetic, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's cool. I mean, as you know, uh, definitely, definitely challenging. Um, and they're a little premature and, and COVID time. So, you know, makes life challenging. I think the first six months were kind of almost killed us and, you know, well, figuratively, not yeah. actually, uh, really tough. And, I think uh, all three kids at some point were not sleeping through the night, which was, which is difficult, but uh, you know, we made it through, you know, we're on the other side and, you know, we figured out how to, how to survive. Yeah. And I didn't survive. realize. Yeah. Survive, not thrive. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like hang in there, you know? I think yeah. that's part of it is like realize right now it's survive time. We'll thrive later. And they were born yeah. during, I mean, right at the start of the whole pandemic, right? That's a, that is oh, an yeah. interesting story for their lives. One day they'll be like, remember when you were babies, this, uh, this world was shut down. Yeah, actually, you know, COVID, uh, well, the health scare of COVID, you know, giving birth like for my wife with a mask on hard, right? Like, you know, you think you can't breathe with a mask on walking around. <laughs> you definitely are not enjoying it with the mask on, yeah. you know, pushing babies out of you. But, um, but, you know, it gave us, you know, not being able to travel, it, the fact that the whole world kind of swapped, like, I feel like the whole world had twins. I'm like, okay, cool. Like everyone will start to travel when, when we can travel too yeah. and have more fun. So we didn't, you know, we, we didn't have as much FOMO and whatnot, uh, which was helpful, but yeah. you know, then the scare of, and uh, of, of COVID around like, you know, uh, babysitters and whatnot, you know, we're just like, okay, fine. We'll just, we'll just do it ourselves. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, the rest might be easy after this. You're right. So, so let's get right into it. I mean, I'm blown away. I didn't even know, I knew about Mailshake, which is an incredible email, cold email service that I use, incredible company. I didn't know you've got four plus more companies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is I something, think it was like nine at some point. Yeah. So something that all dads are struggling with, and you are the epitome of like multiple balls in the air. How do you balance all these things this balance even exists we had like uh david cancel from drift on and he's like balance doesn't even exist really you need to pick where you're going to be intentional and be there and then switch to the other but 
how have you adapted and uh, learned to be able to run your companies, also be present with the kids and maybe some suggestions for our audience that could be helpful? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just tell you the answer, which might not be helpful uh, to dads that are in it now, but um, we, my wife and I intentionally chose we waited to have kids until we were ready. Uh, businesses, biz, like as an entrepreneur, I was ready. Uh, and, and, and we kind of built around, like I was like, I built Mailshake. If I would try to do that same grind I did the first year or two now, it would be incredibly difficult. I would never been able to do five businesses alongside uh, having kids and three kids. So I think part of it was intentionally choosing like, hey, I'm going to go do us now. And then eventually when we're ready, when it feels like a good time, we'll have kids. Now that answer is not helpful because you have kids. <laughs> if you're watching, you probably have kids. Right, or right. You know, Must be nice, Sujan, right? <laughs> must be nice, right? Yeah. But I, I think like David Cancel says like, uh, yeah, intentionally choosing the things you want to do. So I, I think there's three things. One is I've sat like, I was like, I refuse to accept that like I have to run a business and that means I can't be there for my kids. Like I'm just going to be there. Like that's it. Whatever needs to happen to be there, I'm going to be there. So that's like number one. And I define what be there means. Um, and it, it, you know, there's a lot of guilt and stuff that could pent up, but I'm like, look, the thing I could do to, for my kids is just be a good role model by my actions. Like, and then they just watch me do stuff. So I do morning routine. I take them to school, you know, first 90 minutes of the day is me uh, as the lead. My wife's helpful. Like with, with three kids, it's both of us, but I'm like, I'm going to, I'm charging the, the kind of lead. I am not there in the evening. I'm there in the evening, but I'm not the lead. I'm the backup. I'm like the secondary. I just kind of follow what needs to be done. And I'm there for support, but like that, my morning time is my time. Like that's what we do. You know, I'm a morning person. Um, and, and so it's just, it's just going to happen. Um, and the evening I can't be there. I can't do both. Right. So my wife works early and I work late and, and it works. Um, it's not perfect, but it works. Mm -hmm. And I don't work late as in like, I'm working till eight or nine o'clock. No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of working late until six. Mm -hmm. Um, and, so that's late for me, right? And, and, and that means like I'm barely doing, if I work just nine to five, I'm barely doing a 40 hour work week, barely. And that's like, if everyone is perfect, my workout ends on time, you know, everything like that. And we'll talk about the workout exercise stuff later. But um, the next thing is like, I am intentional about the things as an individual contributor I do. And that's like typically one or two things a day. It's like, I don't do a lot myself. I'm more of a manager. And I delegate a lot and delegate delegation is not so much like, Oh, like you don't want, you want to be lazy. Like you still have to help people with the decisions. Like you hire smart people. They're going to still come back to you with things they may need help on or struggles. But um, I try to do the role myself for a few months as an individual contributor. And then I hire somebody that's more specialized senior experience to be able to do that role. Right. And so, uh, and that frees up my time to do nothing. And I, uh, my job every day, I want to get to a point where I can do nothing. Um, like meaning I'm obviously not going to do nothing. And like, I'm not going to be like getting rich quick or like, I'm not going to be on a beach just chilling. I I'm not programmed to like do nothing mentally, but I mean, nothing where I'm responsible. I'm not responsible as an individual contributor to anything. That means I've got the best, possible people working on it the best people i could hire I could that's for the 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 time of the company and and what i do is think about what we're missing think about the things that no one else is thinking about learn the things that are required or level up uh to the next kind of challenge right so um sometimes that's reading a book sometimes that's talking to to other folks sometimes that's uh learning a new specific skill or there's a lot of the, I don't know what I don't know. I, and, and it's as you learn and absorb more information, you figure it out over time. Right. So, you know, um, learning to sell it. Like, so learning, the, like, so I'm not in the day to day of a lot of my businesses, meaning I am checking in on them and I am the point person that they ping when there's a problem. So my day is just to hang out and like answer people's problems 
And some of my answers are just like, you should do what you think is right. And it's like a totally useless answer. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes, I, and I tell my team this, I'm just going to not be there sometimes. So although I will be your safety blanket, don't, sometimes you're just going to lose your safety blankets for weeks at a time because I'm busy slash I just am going to ignore you because you're going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I throw everybody under the bus at least like once a month. Like mm-hmm. I'm just, I intentionally like, dude, figure it out. I'm busy. Mm-hmm. And, or I don't even respond, which is worse for them because they're like, I don't know what to do. And I think like I've done this probably a hundred times. And I think maybe once or twice people made decisions that I thought were not the right ones. I was like, Hey, look, I would have approached this decision differently. It's like kind of a large, like, a, like support. Maybe like, this is kind of like a large refund. Maybe you want to like ping the salesperson uh, to see how you can save this or, you know what, but next time let's just set some rules. Like anything above X ping this person. Mm-hmm. And that we just create processes on the like things that are edge cases. Um, and by no means am I just like kind of cruising around. Right. But like, I've got, you know, I, I started the content marketing efforts at Mailshake in 2017, 16, I think oh, 15, I just started blogging weekly. And, and then like we hired a content marketer and they helped scale stuff. And then like we hired, you know, a VP of marketing and we've kind of built out the team, although I'm involved in the writing process and, you know, interviewing, you know, parts influencers and interviewing experts, I'm not really a part of the post-production. So to, for me to bang out some content, it's like 15, 20 minutes. For me to do an interview, it's like 30 minutes. But after, before, what happens before, what happens after, I'm not involved in, right? So um, I'm only doing the part that I think that the I'm a specialist at. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it's just doing the right things. And then like backing up, I know this is a long-winded answer, but not just being intentional, I think it's being deliberate as well as like choosing uh, focus on the right things that can move the needle. And this is important. I find too many founders. I see too many, even if you're an employee, like what are the three to four things you can count on one hand, things you do right in life, in your role, in your business that will change the business trajectory, that will grow it, that will improve the business, that will like level you up, get you that promotion, whatever you're doing. Um, that, that new opportunity. Um, and I, it's a handful of things. And, and sometimes it's, it's hiring some folks, you know, sometimes it's learning something, figuring out one problem. Like, so if you're a SaaS business, it might be like, my turn's high. Let me figure that out. Right. So because I've got headspace and it's not perfect every day, but because I aim to get headspace and time every day, I'm buying back my time, uh, by hiring folks. Um, I have time to go solve these incredibly difficult problems that I have not experienced for. Right. But um, um, yeah, that, that's kind of what I do. And, and, and again, like those one to two things I do a day, they're fucking hard. Like <laughs> they're, 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 they're big things. Right. Um, um, and, and so like, for example, you know, we at Mailshake had a, you know, diversity problem, like as a, as an Indian guy, running the company like or or like as a founder of the company i i didn't really think about diversity i'm like i don't know like i just build the like i just hire people that are really great and then Mm -hmm. it turns out we built a lot of dudes specifically you know white dudes at the company like this is kind of like this feels wrong and and it wasn't you know it wasn't until we actually looked at it i was like this is just kind of weird like we just don't you know and, and everyone's diverse like we're remote. We're from like all parts of the U S and, and North America for the most part. And so it's like, I don't know. It's just, it didn't feel like we didn't have a diverse kind of um, company because well, everyone's from everywhere, different parts of the world, right? Like some people like to hunt and some people like to surf and there's somebody who likes to like knit and somebody's a gamer, but they're all different walks of mm-hmm. life. You know, I like cars and motorcycles and I like going fast and, you know, we're all kind of different, but we're not. So we, we had to intentionally figure out how to hire talent, how to build, you know, diversity, kind of how to get, not even hire diverse candidates, but like how to, how to actually attract them and how to change the, like the applicant pool to get more. Um, and it was a lot of like how to write a job description. I'm like, I've, I don't know. I've hired like hundreds of people. I don't have to think about hiring and making a job description. Like that hasn't been something I thought about like that hard, but it was just like, you know, we found like through, you know, through lots of conversations and, and training and like learning, we found like, 
you know what? Our job descriptions are too loaded with like demands, like the skills required. And it turns out, I think it's like 60% of women don't apply to job descriptions. They don't fit perfectly for, Mm -hmm. whereas males, they apply to things they definitely aren't suited for. This is Mm -hmm. not me saying this, that's a stat. And so turns out we're actually repelling women from applying because we had some stupid requirements. Like you must have a, an MBA or like, you know, five years experience. And we're like, do you really need five years experience? Or do we need like two years or three years experience, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it's like really basic stuff that, that, that helped us kind of solve that problem. And now we're not, it's not a hundred percent fixed. It's, it's a, we're all actively thinking about it. And as well as like, now we've got like 30% more people, uh, 30% of our new applicants are, are, are female um, and, and we've got the, the org is probably around like 30, 40 or something percent kind of not white dudes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that, that's kind of my measurement, not yeah. white dudes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry yeah. if that's offensive, but you know, that, no, that's kind of that's, the, the, the bar there. Yeah, that's good. And what I took from a lot of that is like you did, it sounds like you were doing a lot of these roles yourself with the goal of, I want to phase myself out of it. You weren't skipping learning a lot of these skills, you're saying, I'm going to do the grunt work. And then I want to know how to hire somebody to replace me instead of just trying to skip that and said, we need a, a head of marketing and who should we hire? Well, I think that part is a, a little bit more of a necessity than a in, intention. Mm-hmm. Um, meaning we're bootstrap companies. All of our companies are limited in, in what we can do by our cash or our, our or what we can do with because of the money's money we have or not have, I right? don't mm-hmm. have. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think we like sometimes the best person for the role is the one we can afford, AKA me mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, or, or someone else. Right. And so, um, yeah, I think it was that, that, that has helped us though. Um, that has helped us because, you know, when we hire, when we hired our first salesperson, I'm like, no, nah, like we know what our deals are. Like I do them. I'm not very good at sales, but we, if I can close deals, any dummy can close deals, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, cause I'm, although like I come off as I'm very extroverted, I actually don't like talking to people. Like I don't like small talk, you know, like I'm a little, I'm fairly introverted uh, in, in, in most as- facets of my life. Um, and, and so I, my, my objective is to avoid phone calls, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and that doesn't work when you're a salesperson. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost opposite, but anyways, yeah. Uh, that has helped me particularly avoid hiring you know hiring hiring better talent because Mm -hmm. i've done the role um it's probably not the right advice i would say i'd say it's the opposite if you're funded or if you've got you know uh, if you want to move faster i'd say go go um go hire people that are more experienced early on um but it 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 takes more cash and it takes uh it takes away from other things Mm -hmm. i'm curious you said uh you're introverted and you're you're an excellent charismatic speaker how did you become the people that are a little bit gun shy about sales, any tips for like how you broke out of that and how you got good and then how you knew how to hire the right people? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, communication and like verbal communication, even written communication is something as a kid, as a, as a, in college in my twenties, I sucked at, I don't think I got good at until probably like 2015, 16. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, uh the, the things I did was just repetition, right? Like I just kept doing it. I just kept showing up. I was like, I, I went from like, I did a lot of public speaking again. Like that was the scariest thing in the world to me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm just going to do it. What's the scariest thing in the world. Just go do that. Like whatever you're scared of most uh, do that. And, and I think you'll find one. It's not as hard or scary or fearful. Uh, it's not as difficult as you think it is. Um, on the other end, just doing it once we go, like, oh, uh, if you're afraid of heights, go skydive. You did it once. Like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Like mm-hmm. you thought you were going to die, but like 99.8%, nine, uh, it's actually almost like close to a hundred percent of people who do their first skydive. No one, no one really dies from that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, go do that. You're like, Oh, that wasn't that bad. Um, yeah. Or you're like, I, I don't want to do it. And you know, you might be the few people, but yeah, I think it's just kind of just repetition. So um I learned about sales. I talked to other salespeople. So my way of learning and absorbing a skill set is go read, read a few books, um, read a few blog posts. I started the blog post. I find some books and I talk to a few experts and I typically it's like three, three of each. Maybe the blog post might be like 10, but three books, 
couple, maybe a dozen or so blog posts and three experts, uh, people who are doing sales right now. And that's my, my belief of like learning the basics minimum requirement to learn a skill set or like a, a job function. Um, and then you have some remote idea of what like kind of decent looks like. And um, I've been fortunate enough to kind of build my network. And so like, you know, again, building my personal brand, speaking at conferences, writing content, like being out there, which is again, that takes work. Um, and it's again, not something that just like overnight happened. It's like, yeah, I just kept doing a little, spending a bit of time every week until it was a habit and yeah, I've been doing it consistently. But uh, my point is um, that like, when you talk to those experts, if you don't, like, I've been fortunate to just be able to be around them. Meaning if I just tweet something, I might be able to find somebody. I can just ping somebody and just ask for that favor. If you don't have that like um, personal brand or whatever, pay somebody, like go on clarity.fm or go on LinkedIn, like ping whoever. and be like, Hey, look, uh, can I just buy an hour of your time? And most of the time you'll find people won't charge you. Um, most of the time they'll just do it on clarity FM. Yeah. You, you, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way to find experts and specialists. Um, yeah, you'll pay them, but like, you, you know, you buy, if you buy like, for example, I'm on clarity, I charge 500 bucks an hour, um, for SEO, digital marketing, what have you, but like you pay me 500 bucks. I mean, first of all, I, I donate all that stuff to charity or whatever, but, um, that 500 bucks, you'll get like $5,000 worth of value because, the question is going to be loaded. Like, Hey, how do I fix my SEL? And well, first of all, I have to do, I have to do my homework to be able to do it. And, and like the amount of like direct information you're going to get, it's going to save you a lot more money. And that, that's just not my rate. Like, that's not just me. I think that's every expert. Um, Cause you ask a very pointed question. You're going to just, they're just going to tell you the answer. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if I, you know, in order, if you're, if you're fixing your SEO, you might have to do an SEO audit. And I'm like, I'll just tell you the five things to fix on your site. You know, and it will be a bulleted list, mm-hmm. with no no research behind it. But I'll tell you to explain it, anyways. So um, do that, and you'll. I think you can learn any any skill. Yeah, ask and don't be afraid to fail and embarrass yourself because those that is where the the gold lies. I I hear, and I I think a lot about what you're saying as to your kids are very young still, mine are too. But how we can teach those things to our kids that. Uh, oh. I even heard uh, Derek Sivers had an awesome quote where he told his kid, he actually, it was like his lullaby to him every night, whereas uh, whatever scares you, go do it. So whether that's uh, riding a roller coaster or getting in front of your friends and, you know, playing the piano or whatever it is, like that skill set. And that's that's a really empowering thing that you're going to be able to give to your kids. I'm not sure if your parents pass that down, but it seems like today there's a lot more parents that are aware of that and are trying to, to teach that to their kids. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an, that's an amazing thing. I, I love that. Um, I'm, I, I think we're trying to still teach our kids to like, you know, crawl uh, yeah. and, and our two-year-olds learning, you know, a little bit more about, I'm trying to teach him about fear, but I don't think he quite, quite gets it, but I, I think that's a great lesson. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I, I like yeah. that. I'm going to try to figure well, out how to apply that. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, well, and the other thing you, you spoke about too, I'm always trying to relate it to both entrepreneurship and parenting and that uh, when you're talking about delegating and everything like that, and I find that with my kids, you could do everything for them. They're going to ask you to, but really empowering them to, no, you need to tie your shoe. We're going to sit here and work through it. Somebody could do it for you. And those are things that like our instincts are to help them solve their problems. But I think we do them a disservice by doing everything for them. You know, easy to talk about, harder to do sometimes when you need to just get the heck out of the house. But uh, those are good yeah. things to keep in mind for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think to uh, over every like every challenge requires this like pain for a given amount of time, right? Like you know, think about sleep training, right? Um, that is three months or two months of just hell to get years of great, right? It's no more than three months. Um, if you have like a kid with a health issue, like a physical, actual health issue might not work my guarantee i guarantee that people are going to wrongfully put themselves in that bucket and not try because mm-hmm. it's right. hard right. three months is difficult but not as difficult as like 10 years or three mm-hmm. years of not sleeping right yeah. and so i think it's like that like challenge um and I, I like you know i think there's this i like to parent by action um meaning i just do stuff 
that's good. And it's a monkey see monkey do, right? Like, so my kid sees me work every day. And so he just comes to the computer and types shit, right? Mm -hmm. Like right now he doesn't know how to type or do anything in a few months or years, he'll be getting better and he'll like, and I'll teach him what I'm doing. And like, if he sees me on the like exercise bike, I, I don't have a Peloton, but I've got like a, a Bowflex, whatever. I'm on the bike like a lot. Um, and he sees me on it. So like he goes, rides his bike and he's like, I'm like dad. And mm -hmm. he, he just, he just says that randomly. Right. Um, and then he sees me huff and puff and you know, what does he do? He tries to bike faster and he falls every mm -hmm. time. But like, that is, I think that's like the, the, the stuff that I think, uh, goes a long way as a parent or a dad of like just just do a thing you're trying to teach your kid to do yeah that's so easy great. to say again there's still a lot of pain before it gets to good but i think it's it's worth it yeah embrace the suck a little bit and it is true with the sleeping i mean i've got a my three-year-old is still kind of transitioning to her big girl bed and it's like it's so much easier to just say just come in bed with me and fall asleep. But I know that's a long term, not what I want. So it's like, I got to do that walk back and forth at 2am, 4am, and I'm losing my mind. But I do remember like, uh, or I try to remember it, or I remember it the next day that that pain yeah. is hopefully going to pay off. Whereas taking the easy road is probably just going to lead to worse habits. Absolutely. Um, so what about uh, your dad? Did you learn any of this stuff from your dad? Or what is now that you're a, you're a parent, anything that you kind of had this light bulb moment and, and kind of embraced uh, and passing down? Yeah, I think so. So my parents, you know, were immigrants. Um, you know, I got the typical story of my dad. My parents came to this country with like 40 bucks in their pocket. And I mean, it's, it's true. Like what that, just seeing your parents and your dad go through like, I, I thought it was 40, but actually a few months ago, he corrected me. It was 20. Right. Wow. And I was like, Whoa, he had support, you know, he had family nearby and like support for, for, for weeks or days. Like that's how long the runway he had. So like, I always think about like, anytime life is difficult, I'm like, dude, coming to a new country, not speaking the full language, not having a job lined up and having two, three weeks runway left. Um, and on favors, like, and not even there's no backup option because you have no money to go back that's fucking hard so i think for me i learned a lot of like just going through my, my dad and my mom just kind of making it right um so was there a specific lesson i think uh the big things i've learned the big thing i learned from my dad was um uh napkin math um and what that is is like i he used to take me to the gas station as a kid and he's like um the bill cost this it's x dollar it's 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 z cost it costs x dollars a gallon how many gallons did i fill up right like fucking hard right i'm not with the calculator just like figure it out right yeah. and he'd bring a notepad and he'd just tell me to go figure it out right and i obviously never got it right um well like in the beginning and eventually got better and better and then he's like he just take me to place like hey like how many um you take me like the fair or like a, what's it called? Like a, a fruit, mar uh, farmer's market. And like, Hey, like how many like smoothies do you think this shop sells? And, and they would just try to figure out and reverse engineer, like how much money this person's making. Right. What does it take? What do you think the costs are? And the beginning is like, Hey, how many, how many like smoothies you get? Like you buy me a smoothie. I'm like, Hey, how many smoothies do you think they sell a day? Mm -hmm. And it just make me ask me weird questions. Right. But that kind of stuff really helped me as an entrepreneur because I, I do like the napkin strategy approach, which is like, if it, if your marketing strategy or growth strategy doesn't make sense on a napkin or like a piece of paper, it ain't going to pen. It's not going to go any further than that. Like if you can't figure out on your, on a pen and paper, like how you're going to get customers, it's why, you know, it's traffic, it's leads, it's customer it's revenue. How can you scale this? You know, whatever. Um, then it's not going to make sense when you actually do it. It's going to be worse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and on paper, it's like you think it's going to work. But when you actually do it, it might always work. So even there's a, like there's a percentage de degradation that will happen when you actually implement stuff. But yeah, a lot of this stuff I just came from my dad in the you know farmer's market and gas station that like I thought was – I only went because he gave me candy and he mm -hmm. buy me candy. Um and uh, yeah, so that was, that was like, I think the most powerful thing. 
That's that is good. We do that with our kids some too. And even like the uh, they're obsessed with these. You'll see when they get older, these YouTube videos are just like crack for these kids. Mm -hmm. But I wa I've been watching some of the like uh, breakdowns of the business models of these 22 year olds. And it's fascinating to me. It got me more interested. And we started talking about how many subscribers they have. You know, they're fascinated by is hit that like button and all that. I was like, well, if you get a thousand subscribers, you can get five dollars. So it is like yeah. teaching these little lessons because this is kind of their their napkin math too. And even the gas station, right? That they love getting out there and pumping the gas. So next time we will do some some math problems. That's good. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Those YouTube videos. We watch Blippy all the time. Oh my God. Blippy is killing it. <laughs> yeah, he's crushing it. Yeah, I know. It, it annoyed me until I like learned about uh, that. This is just some guy that created this, you know, business. I was like, good for him, you know. Yeah. I don't even think he has kids, so that's the uh, that's the <laughs> ironic twist of it. Um, we like yeah. to do on the show one dad tip. Sujin, can you share a? You've given us a lot already. A tip for other dads out there? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest tip I can say is if you're a dad, go find other dads to hang out with and bring your kid and hang out. Like that's it. Um, I think the takeaways from that is you're going to learn a lot from other dads. They're all going to do it differently than you do. Uh, bring your kids, go to like a brewery, go to a park, whatever. Right. And then try to make that a regular thing. Um, I've learned so much from that. Um, and it's not like somebody's like, I do this every, before COVID. I did this a lot. Like we would do like every couple of weeks, we'd get together and like go to the park or every week. And I just learned like the other approaches to like how people raise their kids and, uh, and uh, yeah, just like absorbed it. Like no one told me to be different or change things. But like I started like, I started learning the things from like my friend who did it differently, right? Like who let his kid fall off the playground and the mm -hmm. swing set and like, hey, just shake it off. And, and like, yeah. And then like also just random stuff like that. So I think, yeah, just be around other dads. And if you ever find yourself like, ah, that's, that's not, you know, I don't like the way this person does it. Don't invite them next time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it'll help you, on, you know, no, it's not great to compare yourselves to others, but like it'll help you get a bar of like where you're at and like what you think is right and wrong. And I think if you surround yourself with more rights um, and you'll, you'll kind of get there. And I think, um, I think being dad is a little different than being a mom because mom, moms have like a lot of, like, don't get me wrong, that's harder job. So first of all, harder job, but like, there's not as, it's not as prevalent of like being in a dad group. It's not like as prevalent to be like, yeah, like I want to go hang out with my kids. Cause like, there's this still like this stigma of like, I'm a dad. Like I'm a, I, I'm going to go out and drink beers with my boys and play poker. Right. Mm -hmm. That's cool too. But I just mean like, there's not as like, there's not this, like, it's not cool to be an active parent, an active dad and like talk about it and whatever. And I think that needs to change and it will. But, um, you know, the more you can do that, I think, uh, and get yourself exposed to that, I think the better father you're going to be by accident. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. That's something I think about a lot. I, I do think our generation is kind of, you know, different than a lot of generations of fathers before that we are more involved in these day-to-day -day things. And just even having that camaraderie and that kind of bond, you know, you can get really isolated as a dad doing all this and not having that friend group or that other dads to talk to. So I think, that's another thing you got to, and, and dads aren't as good as moms are at getting together. So you got to be again, more deliberate about it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, 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 it's hard to, to kind of tell other people like, Hey, you, you do need help. You want to hang out and you want to hang out with your kids. It's yeah. just like not a common thing. Tell us real quick. About, yeah. yeah you're, you're on fire. I see with your 75 hard talk about what you're doing and basically more generally why I know you've had, lost 50 pounds, gained 50 pounds, lost 50 pounds. How is that? Why is that so important to you as a dad? How is that helping you? And you know, what kind of advice would you give other dads trying to get after yeah. it these days? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, first of all, I've like, I've lost, I've, I think back in 2011, I, I, I lost like 45 or 40, I think 47 pounds. And I kind of gained a bunch of muscle and really turned my lifestyle around from like, just, like being unhealthy eating and like no activity and focusing on my business. I had a business at the time, much like I do now. And it just like, like kicked my butt. And, and I was like, I, you know, I just stopped one day and something kicked in and it worked. And then I kept that kept up for like five years, six years. And then like I moved and like my routine got on, I was traveling a lot and my routine got messed up and then I fixed it. 
it took me, you know, I never gained back the 50 pounds. It's probably like 20 pounds. Every time I like it lasted for a while and then something changed. And, and so this last time I, I heard about this thing called 75 hard um, and, and I read about it. I know I listened to someone's podcast and a friend told me about it. Then I listened to the podcast and I was like, this is not for me. Like, this is too crazy. I, I mean, I ex- at that time I was exercising daily uh, five times a week and and I had all these like mental limitations. And I, I mean, I still do. Everyone has mental limitations. Like, but these are like boundaries I put on myself. And I'm like, oh, I can't exercise on the weekend. I have a, I had one kid at the time. Like, no, like I, I need to help out with my kid. And that's like, I don't want to leave my wife alone and whatever. Or like, you know, I've got a lot of time. Like, um, I, I can't, I, I have to work. I can't hang on. The, I can't really exercise here. Or like, there was just all these excuses I gave up. And I, and so I was like, just one day, I was like, no. So I was always inspired to do 75 hard. So 75 hard is two exercises a day, two 45 minute exercises. One has to be outdoors, which is freaking hard. So I hate outdoors. I used to, now I love it. Um, drink a gallon of water, read 10 pages um, a day and um, uh, have a diet, like pick a diet and stick to it. No cheat days, no alcohol. Um, now any one of those things is probably not that difficult, but everything combined, it's actually quite difficult. Um, for me, I'm 30 days in now and it's not like difficult. It's logistically challenging is what I call it now. Mm -hmm. But a month ago, maybe two months ago, I thought this was impossible. So I'm recovering from shoulder surgery. Uh, about seven months ago, I have shoulder surgery and like, it takes about a year to fully kind of get back to pain-free so it's still painful and I've got knee problems. And one of them, one of my, like my left leg knee requires surgery to fix uh, like cartilage kind of missing. And, and so it just hurts when I move my knees uh, specifically in impact sports or impact anything, which is pretty much climbing the stairs to like jogging. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I just thought to myself, I would never, I'm never going to be able to do 75 hard because I just, there's just, I have too many ailments and I have three kids now, like all these like things. I run multiple businesses, although that, that hasn't been the, the most challenging part. So anyways, I gave myself so many freaking excuses and, and limitations about, oh, I can't do two exercises a day. I can't do outdoors. I have bad allergies. I have bad knees. I've got this. And like, um, and one day, one day, and so I've always wanted to do this. And one day I actually happened to accidentally do two workouts in a day. Uh, I was paddle boarding. Uh, I, I, I was exercising in the morning, uh, got that done. And in the evening, my friends like, you want to go paddle boarding? And I just like, my, my, uh, my parents had the kids. And so I was like, yeah, sure. That sounds awesome. I haven't really, I've never been paddle boarding before. Let's just go. How do you, he's like, I've got a board. Don't worry. Just show up, dude. We'll figure it out. I'm like, okay. And then I just happened to do two exercises. It was a Tuesday, random Tuesday. Um, and I just did it. And I was like, whoa. I guess I did most of 75 hard except for drink a gallon of water, read 10 pages, which I read a lot anyway. So I was like, this is not going to be difficult for me. And uh, yeah. And I was like diet. I mean, I only had lunch today, so I, you know, I, that's mm-hmm. easy. I can just eat a good dinner. So I was like, I already did the hard part, which to me was a workout. So I'm like, Oh, cool. I'm almost done. I just got to drink a gallon, by the way, drinking a gallon starting at 5 PM. It's freaking hard. I <laughs> like, heard. I, yeah. I, that but so if you pace yourself right so i've got one of these bottles now which is uh five of these is a gallon so i can drink five of these and so now i know if i drink two of these before 12 i'm most i'm almost halfway there i can i i know i'm gonna drink two at night and i could drink one throughout the day really mm-hmm. easy right so um, it's just kind of these systems so anyways i'm 30 days in it's no longer what I thought was impossible because of my ailments. Now, don't get me wrong. Ailments are really hard. Like recovering from soldier surgery, really freaking hard. I have so many limitations of workouts I can do, but I could still work out. I, I just have to, go- it's spent, I spent an hour Googling exercises and I ping my physical therapist and I ping my surgeon and just said, Hey, like, what are some like weightlifting stuff I can do? And they just, they gave me the workouts. So I was like, well, I have no excuse now. Mm-hmm, right. <laughs> and, and then I started, I was like, 
they're just like, do anything that's low impact sports. So I just Googled low impact outdoor activities and I found a gazillion or mm -hmm. not a gazillion, but like 10. Um, and so I've been kayaking, paddle boarding, hiking. By the way, I live like five minutes from the lake. I live across the street from a hiking trail. Uh, a, a running trail is in my neighborhood. And so within like, I, I can do all this stuff right next door. Like it's been next door the whole time. What was the problem? My mental limitations, right? Like, um, so it's just like these weird, like, th like limitations I put on myself. Three kids, really hard to do. So I have to find these lots of time. But so every morning, every the night before, I look at like, when am I going to get my workouts in? When am I going to get workout one, workout two in? My particular challenge, which is makes it really difficult, is I have to exercise either before 6.30 a.m., after 8 a.m. and before 5.30 or after 8 p.m. So like, it's just like, I, that's like the limitations because of the kids. Um, otherwise I have to get a babysitter to do all these things. And I don't, I don't want to do that. Like I, I want to spend time with my kids. So I've got limitations, but I figured out how to do it. And turns mm -hmm. out 45 minutes, you know? So what I did was like, when I have calls with people, um, you know, it turns out, like I told you, I, I ping a lot of people to learn things I don't know. Those calls I do while hiking. I'm not running my ass off. I'm not like pace. So what I've done is like, I'll do the hike part where I run in the beginning. And that's like, I'll do like maybe a mile and a half of running. So about 15 minutes or 20 minutes of running um, and then, or jogging, I guess. Um, and then the 30 minutes afterwards, I'll be on a call with somebody and I'll just learn stuff while moving. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been pretty shitty weather, like raining, snow and and, and um, snowing, it doesn't ever snow in Austin. So I was like, oh fuck, how am I gonna run? How am I gonna, like, how am I gonna do this? It's freaking cold, it's like snow on the road, it's like slippery. I just went hiking, my feet got wet. The first step I took into the trail, I'm like fuck it, I'm just gonna go forward. Mm -hmm. One step under, after the other. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna put an alarm, 22 minutes and 30 seconds so I can turn around. And I just, I just didn't turn around, mm -hmm. whatever. Anyways. Um, but what I thought was impossible 30 days later, I'm like, this is just logistically challenging mm -hmm. to like, now it's kind of like, just make sure I get, I slot the times in my day. Yeah. Planning it, I guess. It's hard to wing it when you have this. It sounds like the you night can't before wing it. you're right. You, can't, you, you will fail if you wing it. Yeah. Um, you will fail and you wing it. And like, I think what the craziest thing about this is like, people think it's the physical outcome um, that you get from it, which has been amazing, by the way. That was not why I did it. I did it for grit. Like grit is one of those things. I think I've always been good at pressure. I've been like good at like hard things, but I've lived a pretty good life. And I think I lost the grit. Well, I never like, I think I like the good life gave, like I drive a McLaren every day. Like it's like it, it and I have three healthy kids and I have, more time than I, I have less time than I have. I have more money than I have time. And like, I'm pretty, like, I'm pretty down to earth in the sense, like, I don't really have a lot of things outside of cars where I spend my money on. And so I, I don't really need more money. So I kind of, it, that kind of killed my success kind of killed my grit. Right. And, and I'm like, so 75 hard to me, like helped me build mental, like uh, just that grit and, and the stamina. And I'm like, from like what sounded impossible to um, is now just like, just make sure I plan a day ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like that's a very big change. Right. And now I'm kind of thinking to myself, I'm like, should I just do this forever? Yeah, I don't think it's that hard. And so, um, and I, I think I'm going to keep trying to push myself mentally and physically to see where I can go. And I think uh, there's a good book. Uh, David got, Goins? Goggins. 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 Yeah. There you go. He he has his book, and one of the quotes is like, "Whenever you think is your, wherever you think your limit is, is typically forty percent of your actual limit, mm -hmm. right?" And I'm like, "Whoa, that's crazy." So like, when I think this is like, I gotta stop. I've got sixty percent in my gas tank to keep going, and I'm like, so so that it's perspective and grit change has helped me. And, and I didn't mean to brag about like what I do and have, but you know. I think it, that has affected me negatively um, to be, to not really want me. It, it hasn't prevented me from pushing myself to grow my business. Cause I like growth, but 
it's definitely take the like burning fire from having to grow away. Well, okay. That is good. I cannot let you go though. You mentioned, uh, cars. I have an eight year old and six year old boy besides YouTube videos are obsessed with cars. And I told them I was having a car guy on that has really cool cars. They want to know what is your favorite car and the fastest you've ever gone fire away with that. They're going to be excited. Yeah. So I'll go with fastest I've ever gone. I think, um, fastest at the, uh, I've ever gone, I think was in a motorcycle. Uh, it's 174 miles an hour. Um, car is about this, about like 100 top, like 168, 170, something like that. Um, and um, yeah, really scary. Uh, why it's really scary is like at 170 miles an hour, you have a sharp left or right turn coming ahead in hundreds of feet, yeah. right? And so you have to go from 170. The, the going 170 is crazy fast. It's fun, but the crazy part is from going 170 to making a precise turn hitting like uh you know the, the right apex and exit and going from 170 to 40 to back to 100 again right in this like you know 0.2 mile 0.3 miles of of, of of track so um i'm talking about one specific corner at, at circuit of americas but um yeah that's been the fastest and my favorite car um are you talking about like so let's talk about let's be specific favorite car i want to buy own or like just like favorite car fastest cars you know like what How i about like both? i mean mclaren is they're already going to be excited that somebody i know has a mclaren so that they're going to be excited <laughs> about but they throw out bugatti this devil 13 or something i never even heard of these cars I've they're like, heard of that one. That, it might not even exist but right it, the, our games are dead would you rather buy a lamborghini or a ferrari that's our conversations in the car so i'm talking to yeah. a guy that might have both and he can give me some uh some advice. Yeah, I think um, I think I've, I've always been a fan of McLarens. They're a really true driver's car. Um, so I think uh, probably uh, a P1 or a Senna, um, or like I would say tied for first. P1 would be for like driving on the road and little track. Senna would be like that would be like the you know two three million dollar race car, right? Oh wow. Okay. Um, um, but yeah, so I think that's like a. That's like my, my favorite car I would want to actually buy one day. Although I don't know if I, I don't, I don't, no matter how much money I have, I don't know if I can drop two, $3 million in the car, <laughs> right. you know, wow. it's just like a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. There's another level. I, I guess I need to I'll ask me in 10 years and hopefully, you know, yeah. well, I think they, kind of money. I think they wanted to know McLaren, Bugatti, Lamborghini, Ferrari. I'm like, I don't know how to pick. I mean, what's the, uh, I want something I can so, actually drive. Yeah. So I've driven all these cars. Um, um, I've got a lot of car friends, so we like drive and sometimes we switch cars and whatnot. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. McLaren is a driver's car. Like it feels like you're driving a freaking go-kart. There's not much, like, like there's not much around you. And the, the, way, the driver's position is you can see the road the closest to you. Cause the way they engineer and design the, like the windshield and the, the front of the car, it feels like you're kind of like right on the road. Um, and there's like, you feel everything cause it's a carbon fiber chassis. Lamborghini, most exotic feeling. You feel like you're in a freaking fighter jet because everything's like a flip switch. And, you know, this thing feels like you're in a cockpit. Mm -hmm. It drives really well, but it's like really fast power, not always usable power. Ferrari, I think, is the is, is finesse. Like, it, this is where, like, you – this is, like, you, it is a fast freaking car. It drives really well like a Lamborghini. You know, it drives really well like a McLaren. It has power, but – these Italian guys are like sewing this like perfect suit around mm. you while you're driving. So yeah. it's like, it's, it's like, I think there's every type. So it's a lot more like more bells and whistles and fancier. Um, uh, so those are the three, I would say how I would classify those cars. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, it can't go wrong with any of them. They're all, all right. amazing cars. And they, to, they're going to be disappointed that you cannot go 280 miles per hour. That's not true. That's what they tell me. They're driving their cars on their video games. I said, I don't think they go that uh, fast, but you can go, you can go pretty, you can go over 200 miles an hour. It's just, there's not many roads you can do right. that. On. Oh, okay. On right? video yeah, games, it's, you can you're, do it. you're limited by what actual life, you know, yeah, like yeah. real terms. life is different than you're... what they're living in for sure. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you one thing about Mailshake, which I'm fascinated by, but you had a quote that I really liked too about uh, what is success. And you, ha you had a cool breakdown with uh, the luck, skill, time. Do you remember that one? And can you share that with yeah. us? Uh, I don't remember the exact quote, um, but I think it was like, uh, 
it was like something like like I think uh, it was about cons- like so percentage of time. Uh, so I think it's ten percent luck, twenty percent skill, and the rest is just consistency. Yeah, just hard work and just doing whatever the heck it is. Because here's the thing: luck is like, look, I happen to have, I happen to stumble upon SEO, and at a good time, like it, like it was rising, and so because of that, I went from like like nobody in SEO, like not knowing much to becoming like a director and kind of hitting my glass ceiling at 23. And that did not happen. Well, first of all, I wouldn't have gotten there that fast. And so that's luck. Um, I think the skill is like, man, you, you, went, to, you went to school, you learned something, you're, you're good at something. Skill you brought to the table, right? Like that's what I'm talking about with skill. The other part of it, it's like, Nobody knows everything. Like you think Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, like knew what the fuck they were doing 20, 30 years ago. No mm-hmm. way. Like they, they leveled up mm-hmm. and they continue to push themselves, whether you like them, hate them, whatever they're crazy. Steve jobs, all these, all these visionaries, geniuses like the, and, and those are like, those are like the three or four people that like, you know about what about the million people that are doing crazy stuff that you don't know about mm-hmm. that you'll like, you won't hear their names. Right. Um, you won't read about them. They'll just keep doing stuff. I think that if you rise to the occasion, right. Um, and learning the things you don't know, surrounding yourself with people that can help you expand your worldview, expand, uh, your company's exposure, like, you know, presence. So, um, I think most people, when they show up, think they need 80% of the skills or it requires like your success is determined based off your skill set. I actually think it's, how you handle what you don't know. Like I get punched in the face so right now, randomly. What I do after I get punched in the face is what defines me and what will define the moment of my day. Not so much the fact that I'm a boxer, <laughs> right? Like if I'm gonna, am I gonna get pissed off and get thrown out of this office or is the other person gonna get thrown out of the office or are we gonna hug it out? Mm-hmm. I don't know. So. I think it's a lot about how you handle stuff. Not punch in the face might not be the right, right, right example, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. What's the uh, the the Mike Tyson quote? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I like that one. But yeah, yeah. it is a, it is a good. Uh, I think it was twenty percent skill, ten percent luck, and then seventy percent just busting your ass for five, ten years just, that nobody sees. Yeah, I think it's consistently working hard. Yeah, and you'll figure out things will happen there in that seventy percent you won't even think will ever happen. Right. right. Um, you know, right after this in, in five minutes, I've got calls. I've got a call with somebody who was selling a company and, and this company, you know, their last acquisition was $3 billion, you know? So like, I was not expecting that, that thing just landed on my lap. I was not expecting this, but yeah, I mean, so well, I'll let you know how it goes, but yeah, yeah it's, it's just crazy. It's just, you know, cr- like, how do you plan for that? You don't, you just, you go in prepared. I write about, so what did I do to plan for that unknown event? Well, first of all, it's unknown until they emailed me and we got a call scheduled. Um, so during that time, that window, maybe it was a couple days. I learned everything about this. I, I, I came, I talked to my partner. We came with a game plan, like, you know, and we, we presented it. We gave them information. I, I, I looked at their acquisitions. I got details from them. Like I, I, I'm coming in prepared. I did not know how to prepare for this unprepared event but you figure it out. Right. Mm-hmm. And again, I think, you know, I, I'll end with a quote here that I think most problems are solvable with a Google result, a, a search, a Google search, reading a blog post. Um, and if you really want to dig deeper on that topic, a book or talking to an expert. Right. But like, I think most people live, go around life, not asking the questions. That's good. Yeah. Today more than ever. So, and hopefully our kids are going to use this, these kind of tools too. So that's awesome. To yeah, hear. absolutely. Sujan, I appreciate it. Good luck on that call. Uh, tell people where they can find you. Yeah. Um, best place to find me is my personal blog, sujanpatel.com. Um, kind of write about everything I know, learn the hard way and you just follow the links to all my companies, whatnot. And anything you want to learn about email, Mailshake blog, all that stuff's incredible. It's like, uh, I learned like the best way to send a cold email I, I get from Mailshake. So I appreciate yeah, you putting all you. that content out there. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, go, go to mailshake.com slash masterclass. 
I'll pretty much school you. We, we've like wrote this like, I don't know, 30, 40 page kind of paper on like on everything email. And I, I think like if you're if you're into you know writing and whatnot, I think it's the less is more and you know, get to the point, make your things scannable. Awesome. All right, Surgeon. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Man. You too. See ya.